This is Abe Freetanzer from CinemaDailyUS.com, and I'm thrilled to be speaking with Peter Middleton and James Spinney about their new film, The Real Charlie Chaplin. How are you both doing today? Really good. Really Thank good. you so much for having us. Yeah, yeah. We should say as we start, we, we actually sat just around the corner from, um, we're, in, we're, we're over here in London, and we're sat just around the corner from where Chaplin trained in um, in, in music hall. There was a, uh, a music hall impresario, a guy called Fred Carno, who was very big in, um, in the early 20th century, and, and, and where Chaplin very much learned his uh, his his uh, his stripes as a as a musical performer. So we feel like yeah, very much uh, <laughs> sitting in in Chaplin's neighborhood. Oh, that's great. Where does this interest in Chaplin stem from? What's your earliest memory of of seeing him? Yeah, that's such an interesting question. I mean, I feel like I've always had some image of Chaplin in my head, even when I was a kid. You know, um, that that costume, that famous costume, long before. Funnily enough, I, we were saying recently that I think I assumed that he was a gent. I think the tramp aspect of of Chaplin really was lost on me when I was a kid. I sort of assumed that he was actually quite a, a dignified chap um, from the things I had. Um, I didn't really watch his films till I was a student, and I think Pete's the same. We both watched his films around the same time when we were kind of seventeen, eighteen. I watched City Lights for the first time um, and then Modern Times and was just absolutely blown away by them. Um, and they completely subverted my idea of what silent cinema was. Um, you know, I, I think Chaplin has become emblematic of a quite a cartoonish um, idea of silent cinema, of this sort of super slapstick films played at the wrong speed. Um, and what I found in City Lights and Modern Times was, was like such beauty and pathos, um, but also a character who was really subversive and felt um, very modern in all sorts of ways in terms of, you know, first of all, that relationship that he strikes with the audience when, when Chapman looks at you from across the screen as the tramp and sort of seduces you um, in a way that really kind of um, reaches out at the, um, from the screen towards you, but also, of course, in the, in the themes and in the politics, um, you know, which we try to explore in the film. And it's it's interesting when we were developing this project uh, a few years ago, we, we we did a few workshops with 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 school kids, and and some of them were quite young, about seven years old or so. And we um, we were talking about Chaplin. We started by showing a few images just of the sort of the elements of of, of the tramp costume, and very quickly, you know, hands shot up in the, across, throughout the room as people sort of began to recognise. And of course, pretty much everyone there had heard of Charlie Chaplin even though no one had seen his films. And it really spoke to us that, you know, there's something pervasive about Chaplin that is very much just kind of ingrained in the, in, 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 in the collective cultural uh, consciousness that, that even, you know, a hundred, uh, hundred odd years on still very much means something to, to, to almost everybody, certainly in the West, yeah. Yeah, and it was interesting to see you start with the idea of the imposters and, you know, who is the real Charlie Chaplin? Was that a phenomenon that you really encountered early on in your research for the film? Very much so. Very, very much so. Yes, this idea that almost as soon as he appears on screen, he's kind of being endlessly imitated um, in so many different ways. The films themselves are being pirated and recut and... Um, um, and it's it's interesting because um, it seemed in some ways to us to, to almost feel like a, an analogue for Chaplin himself, who um, who is kind of known all across the world, but who seems, it seemed to us that, that every time we, we kind of came across one version of Chaplin, another one would spring up nearby. And, and, the, and the deeper we went into the project, the more versions of Chaplin we found. So that felt like an interesting starting point, not only in conveying the Chaplin craze, which is also called like, Chaplinoy or um, or the, the chap Charlie Mania, you know, long before the Beatles, there's a sense that 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 he was kind of reaching a type of fame that I think hadn't been possible um, until he came along. You know, when he first steps on the screen in 1914, films are just beginning to spread across the world. By 1916, he's being watched um, in most of the continents by hundreds of millions of people. Um, you know, as we explore in the film, in in France, he's known as Charlot. He's Carlitos in Spain, in Africa. He is uh, Charlie. Professor Alcohol in, J in Japan. Um, so this idea of someone who is kind of loved in a way that hadn't been possible um, before, before films came along. Um, it's so interesting in terms of him being the first celebrity in the, in the sense that we understand it today. Um, and I think given as well where Chaplin came from, you know, these very, this very humble background um, where he had very little education. Um, he, his mother was placed in the asylum. His father died when Charlie was just 13. Um, and he really had to, to fight to kind of um, make his name, his reputation and, and to find his way over to America where he found 
fame and fortune. So this extraordinary like life story and this extraordinary arc, um, but at the center of it, someone who, who we found to be really elusive. You know, the people who knew him best said that, that Chaplin was always performing, he was always acting, he was always on show. So this sense that he was sort of known across the world, recognized across the world, but, but did anybody truly know him? That kind of became the, the question at the center of the film. Yeah. And to me also, I knew a little bit about the um, sort of similar timing of Hitler's existence and the way in which the two not interacted, but sort of existed at the same time. How much of that did you know ahead of time and what was most interesting to you about, about that? Yeah, I mean, it is a strange kind of yeah cosmic uh, thing between the two of them. Yeah, born within a couple of weeks, uh, within a couple of days of each other, both of whom um, were very close to their mothers and resented their fathers. Um, Hitler, of course, was uh, a new poverty. He was on the streets in in, in Vienna, um, whilst Chap at the same time Chaplin was making his fortune playing this tramp character, um, and then of course the. They come to this great kind of <laughs> uh, collision in 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 the 19, uh, 1941 when Chaplin puts out the Great Dictator, and it was um, there's there was it's not in the film, but there is is records that uh, that 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 someone found in the wake of of, of World War II of, of which films Hitler had 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 checked out had taken out. Of course, Chaplin films were banned in Germany going back to the nineteen early nineteen thirties. But um, there is a, a, a record of, uh, of, of Hitler apparently taking out the great dictator twice and seeing, seeing the film twice. Um, so, so that was kind of interesting to us. Unfortunately, didn't, didn't make it in the film. But, but you know, the, the, that whole process of and Chaplin's kind of extraordinary um, stand he took uh, against, against the riding tides of, of, of fascism in the 1930s is, is, um, is a, is, is, it was just a fascinating thing to us. And we knew, obviously, it would form this very much a very important part of of the story you know when he he made the film when he started writing the film um so he finished the script is that right finished the script on the same day that britain declared war on germany so you know he had this thing had been gestating a long time and he'd been telegraphing the the rising tide of fascism in europe long before um it was widely appreciated in uh, across american society you know i think there's a, a poll that was taken um in in the late 1930s bef uh, when when chapman was making the great dictator which, which, which showed that 90% of the US population was pro-isolationism, you know, not getting involved, not repeating the mistakes of the First World War. And Chaplin put his artistic creation out there um, in this extraordinary uh, act of, uh, in, in The Great Dictator. And as we say in the film, in a sense, put, put his tramp character on the, on the altar, you know, after he'd he kind of nailed his colours to the mass and after the tramp spoke, after, after decades of being this kind of silent character, this sort of every man that, that, that people could impress upon their hopes and dreams and ambitions by nailing his, his colours to, to that identity, that the, 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 the identity of a persecuted minority, he was... Um, uh, he knew very much that that would be the the tramp's last act, you know. And when he steps up in front of uh, takes takes the stage and makes that great speech, um, uh, it is an extraordinary kind of curtain call for the tramp. Yeah, and I, I like the way that you you do that in the film, and then you sort of get to the his post career and the other you know uh, things in, involving uh, you know communism and all that. Um, do you think that there is any star or filmmaker today who is somewhat Chaplin-esque, if, if that's even possible? That's such an interesting question. Yeah, I wonder, like, there are so many ways to take it as well, uh, like, in terms of the level of the fame, in terms of the characteristics, in terms of their working process. You know, Chaplin was working in a way that very few filmmakers are able to work to today in the, in the fact that he would start making these hugely ambitious projects without really any real sense of what the plot was, which is which would be very unusual for like a, a megastar to do today. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, what, what do you think? Who, who, who do you think is, uh, has got the a Chaplinist? That's a good question. I mean, I think sometimes I think about parodies. I think about people like Adam McKay. Um, and just different, you know, but I, I don't, I don't know that that's so comparable because I also think that you need somebody who's really on, on all sides of the camera doing all those, which of course we see is not always easy. I, I like the focus that you have on how Chaplin was such a perfectionist and got the scene right a few times and then still had to do it again. And just the agony everyone felt with that. 
and this sense, as you say, that um, his assistant said that if he could have done every role on set, he would have. Um, and he still writes, directs, produces, edits, scores, and stars them. And as you say, is when some, when there's a close up of a, of a, of a lead, uh, of another lead, he'll be next to the camera, showing them like a mirror, exactly how he wants them to perform it. So there's that sense that everyone on the set is transformed into a sort of mini chaplain, a mini version of him. And I think that's what's extraordinary about his way of working is that on, on one sense, he was the ultimate sort of control freak. Um, and on the other sense, he was sort of submitting himself to a process which, which so embraced improvisation, which sort of embraced the idea that we'll start with these incidents and these scenarios that have like a comic potential and that the plot will kind of grow outwards from there. And eventually the final film will emerge, which took a certain amount of faith really. And particularly, as you say, in City Lights, when there was a lot hanging in the balance in terms of talkies coming along. Yeah. And what would you say is your number one unanswered question that you, you wish you had been able to find the answer to during the process of making this film? Wow. Oh, yeah, who is question. the real Charlie Chaplin? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he remains this kind of elusive character, you know, and I, and I guess we sort of, um, we, 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 that title is almost something of a provocation. You know, we were struck very early on just these, these differing accounts, you know, he was, in the same way that the tramp would sort of reform and one film he'd be a boxer and the next form he'd next film he'd be a priest and then and then he'd be a fireman he'd constantly kind of shifting form and um, and identity and and people said the same thing about Chaplin you know we have that quote at the beginning of the film you know enjoy any Charlie Chaplin you have the good fortune to to encounter but don't try and link them up and his friends very much said that about him um, and indeed his family too you know they felt that in a way that he was always kind of performing he was always kind of yeah on show as James said and and and, and didn't really uh, allow people to see his his real self and 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 that led to quite a kind of poignant and painful um, distance I think between especially with 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 a few of his children and um, that they were still kind of puzzling with right up until his last days and you guys have collaborated before do you have a next project uh, in mind or in development we, 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 yeah, we do. We've got a couple of things that we're kind of working on. Nothing that's sort of uh, we're kind of floating in, out there quite yet, but it certainly kept us busy this year. I mean, the, the, our film, the Chaplin film, was uh, slightly kind of derailed by that pandemic um, that's that's on you know ongoing, um, and we were actually we were supposed to we were supposed to finish it um, and and be released in for the for the film festival kind of aut uh, autumn film festival season last year in 2020, but of course things very much got shifted this year but that has allowed us a bit of time to also start working on a few other things so yeah i'm sure we'll uh, we'll have news on that very shortly and i always like to ask filmmakers particularly documentary filmmakers what are some of the best documentaries you've seen this year besides this of course it's been it's been a wonderful year and i think this is also uh, off the back of the pandemic there seems to be a lot that has has been stored up i mean one of my first experience of being back in the cinema this year um, was watching Summer of Soul and uh, seeing it in a, in a wonderful cinema in, in, in Crystal Palace, not too far away from, from where I live at, at, at 2 p.m., a 2 p.m. screening where I'm pretty much the only person in there, but just sitting in the middle of this screen with this fantastic sound and soundtrack in, in that film. Um, but yeah, it's been a wonderful year for, for documentaries. Flea has got a, is, 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 is a really, really impressive piece of work. Um, yeah, I mean, there's, there is a lot out there. Um, and yeah, we're uh, yeah, we feel like we're very much in 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 in, in great company. And we, we we were out in Telluride where a lot of these films were also playing. Um, Procession, Robert Greene's Procession is an extraordinary piece of work, and probably you know, one of the one of the most extraordinary experiences, uh, film experiences I've I've encountered over the last you know five years, <laughs> let alone one year. Great. And what would you say if you had to choose as your favorite Charlie Chaplin movie? Gosh, I mean, how do you choose? How do you choose? I, I mean, for me, it's 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 probably between The Kid and City Lights. Um, City Lights has this special place in my heart because one of the first ones I saw. And I also just think it, he, that it does achieve a, a kind of perfection. Um, but the kid, apart from maybe the, uh, the 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 heaven sequence in the kid, slightly um, slightly knocks it off course for me in terms of but it, but it, but in terms of the emotion on screen and that image particularly of Jackie Coogan with his arms outstretched as as he's separated from um, the tramp, which obviously replays these painful traumas that Chapman experienced in his childhood, where he's separated from his mother 
and she was taken to the asylum and he was taken to the orphanage. Um, so you, those are the two. You can't things. really go too wrong in that extraordinary stretch that, that Chaplin had in the 1920s. So yeah, you go from the kid, uh, the gold rush, the circus, which we don't mention in our film, um, and then and then get, carrying into the 30s, night, um, City Lights and Modern Times. I mean, it is just a, a remarkable run of, um, yeah. Yeah, of, 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 of cinematic uh, greats. How about you? That's a good question. I think probably the the uh, you know the great dictator, but it's uh, it's it's uh, it, there's so many great ones. It's it's uh, you guys have, have reminded me. I need to always have answers to my own questions. Anything I ask, <laughs> just come right back to me. So, but uh, I hope that any Chaplin fan or anybody who wants to know more will check out the real Charlie Chaplin, which premieres on Showtime on Saturday, December 11th. Thank you both so much uh, for speaking to me today, and best of luck in the future. Thank Thanks you for having us. Thank you.